Consequences of Falling. The wind buffeted the city of Carolina and suburbs as the unthinkable happened. A hurricane had made it onto land this far in with all of its strength intact. Rain slanted to it everywhere like bullets, breaking windows and scouring stone, concrete and metal. Winds howled with force that turned anything loose into a missile hazard, pushing flower stems into the speed of missiles and abetting them to poles, throwing cars all over the place and the like. Five cities lay in its path, and though the major one, Carolina itself, could mostly be spared, the poorest suburbs to the south and east would be hit hard. Though the hurricane itself seemed normal, despite its freakish strength and sustaining ability so far from open wire, there would be a few that would feel and discern its true intent. Sitting in the storage basement of the building, both their businesses and home were in, harmonic with their husband. I hope the girls are okay, she said, her voice alit barely above the whistling wind outside. I'm sure they'll be fine, Caswell told his wife. Besides, aren't they already staying in the part of town that's not in its path? Trixie will be fine, don't worry. So will Lyra and Bon Bon. He loved his only child, and was fond of Trixie's lifelong best friend. But his wife thought of Lyra as one of their own as well. Probably because Lyra wasn't as close to her own family as his daughter was to them, he reasoned. And now, with Lyra having a girlfriend, Bon Bon now preoccupied with quasi filial position is Harmonic's heart. I hope you're right, Harmonic said, slipping to her na native accent as he did when she was nervous. Other times he had to remind himself that Harmonic first this was just an act, and that at the end of the day, he really was married to Dixie Flower. They will be, he said, putting his arms around her. Our girls will be. Elsewhere, the skies were so dark that the sirens on duty required night flizz and goggles to perform their night wa their white watch standing. Not that it mattered much. The storm was so strong that any of them were bunkered down with orders to stay in the position of the event it cleared. As that was unlikely, the groups changed in 15 minute shifts in order to prevent gear degradation and getting soaked to the bone. It was during the shift that three dark figures slipped into the rain with giving the jubilant motions that somehow seemed to indicate their enjoyment of the weather. The first one left the fence easily without an issue. Landing on the other side of the large brick barrier, she laughed. <laughs> this is awesome! Cortana laughed. She was curly in her altar form, feeling the blood and magic mixture pumping through her veins, feeling each spire raindrop against her scaly skin as a baby's caress. Yeah, it certainly is! Count someone said as he didn't let the walls well. Given as he was the strongest of the trio, he cleared the wall by nearly a third more than Contaro did, vaulting over it as if it was nothing but a bump in the ground. So, we waiting for stupid? The black team strong woman asked the moment she landed. Aren't we always? Contaro grunted. <laughs> She's probably practicing master basic techniques. Uh, a split second later, Medley landed, joining them. She had a sad, dejected look on her face, like a child who was hand caught in a cookie jar. Sorry I'm late, she said softly. Had to clean up. What do you mean, clean up? Gunson kind of threw it off. Never mind. I don't want to know. Gunson held her something in the air. Wait, do you smell blood, Kenzie? Now that you do. Are you missing it? I do. Smells coming from... Both sirens looked at Medley. What did you do, man? I didn't mean to, Medley stated. Med, don't make me order it out of you. Fine, I was playing with Rick, and I got a little excited and... A tragic look came over her face, as if Medley destroyed her favorite toy by accident. Which, Contrello wondered, might have been the truth. Where did you put the body, Med? Contrello asked. But I didn't mean to... It'll be fine, I'll clear it with the captain. You might get your ass chewed that for it, but we're too valuable to her to do anything serious to. Level 3. Room G321. Medley flips the key out of her pocket. Nobody goes on that floor, so there shouldn't be any issues. Fine. The team leader groaned. She did not need this kind of mess right now. Kenzie, you take Med and execute the mission. It's just two lesbos wanting to bump Buckley, so no harm there. I'll clean up Med's mess and talk to the captain. Roger's that, boss. She looked at Medley with disgust. Come on, stupid. 
were going to be late. With that, the two ran off into the dreary distance. Hopping the wall once more, she made a beeline towards the main building. As she got closer, she noticed one of the guards on duty. Well, well, well. Harmonica Snacks. A petty officer, second class like herself. Gokara never knew why Harmonica was in the sirens. She was too sweet, too kind, and too gentle to be in such a force. She should have been cashiered out, given a new identity, let free to live her own life. Gokara had no use for those kind of so soldiers, and the only reason Harmonica lately reminded her of the sirens was because she was extremely athletic, and a spot on mag when the need arose for it. Well, now she has a different use, Katrao Myos has suggested for it. Too bad she won't be able to dispute it. Still elsewhere. In a dirty, broken warehouse, Alcor met for their newest mission. Standing with them was Chainsley, a mysterious Canadian officer who had been feeding them information. Smoking one of his stogies, especially as he tended to discuss Chainsley, Blackthorne said, Okay, boys. Here's the threefold plan. Tomorrow night, we hit the siren base hard and fast. No survivors. Be clean about it. We don't want to waste ammo. But they're still breathing after the two step, they pop another right into the heart. Body won't survive the brain and the heart being Swiss cheese. You sure, boss? They've been survivors just fine. Let the air team members choke. They all had a good laugh about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were draining their gun bolt. Anyway, once that done, bring explosives to the gas cans. I want this to look like arson. Like some little shit delinquent thought it'd be a good idea to burn a couple of acres of the Everfree. Hope nobody catches his ass. Play this right, we'll have every law enforcement agency in the area looking for a fire bucket, not us. Changely looked at Blackstar and gave a glance. You do know the thing about these, right? We're, you're taking out the bulk of the team, but they do have reserve units that they don't know about. What are you going to do once they come hunting? Blackstar took another draw of his triba and then blew a smoke ring. Ugh. Agent Chasing, he even did a face. We did our homework. We'll be carrying phosphorus rounds. Russian 7851s. Seven, the rest of the MVD will still hold a grudge against those grunts for what happened back at Karachi two years ago. And thanks to one of our boys there. A big man slapped to sent way to his hand. We got some of the Ruskies' toys in exchange for leaving the sirens a message. Our contact at the company doesn't give a fuck, so you shouldn't either. Changely rolled his eyes. So long as he gets the job done, I'm ready to overlook the unnoticed message. Ignoring that, Blythorn went back to him to his man. Anyway, after that comes phase two. He'll be waiting for us, so need to move in quick and hard. I want Loam and his funk toy captured, not killed. He turned back to Chasley. You still got us that flight clearance? Yes, but I wasn't expecting you to kidnap two Americans. I'll have to clear it with my superiors, and they'll contact the CIA. Yeah, whatever. We give the proper people a gift basket there. He grunted. Anyway, after that, boys, then we head out to Belize for some realization. We get to see if Sable alone can land safely after we throw him out of the plane at 40,000 feet. Betty pull up his now. Lastly, I'll have me a nice little cue to take back to my place. Who knows? The fight takes too long, I might share. Chainsley narrowed his eyes at that. He was a professional, and though he did distasteful things, he did it for queen and country, not for pleasure. The barbarian sellsword was an amoral bastard who didn't seem to have a single kind molecule in his body. They were supposedly high, highly effective, but he took no pleasure in working with the bastardly Blackthorn. Neither him nor any of his mongrels. For a moment, Chainsley almost thought the sirens would win their fight against him. Almost. Meanwhile, in the living room of a house at San Palermo, a bunch of games were going on. One group was playing Monopoly, while a second group was playing Uno, a card game that Pinky always seemed to have on her. A third group was watching movies on TV, leaving Sunset, Minuet, and Rainbow to lounge in chairs, sofa, and low seats, reading books. Upstairs, a girl with long plum hair and shocks of purple and magenta moved in quietly towards the door, her hair tied in a ponytail and gauze around her neck. She paused just before the door as if to knock, 
moving a hand down to rap softly against the fiber glass surface. But stopped before flesh can eat, it was swimming like it would. She bent down and walked away, head towards the stairs and back toward, down towards the others. Minnie looked up toward her from her book. Sonny, that's the third time she's done that today. Are you going to do something about that? Sunset slipped her bookmark at its place, then looked at her friend. What should I do, Minnie? I just saw my cousin choking my sister and shouting at her as he hated her. Instead of explaining anything, she just ran upstairs and locked herself in her bedroom for the past seven hours. My parents aren't even sure what the hell to do. So I think they're trying to call Paris right now. Sorry, I'm an only child, so I guess I don't know how to react, Minnie replied. I know, and I appreciate the words, men. But until she comes out, what can we do? Personally, I bust down her door and drag her ass out to explain, Rainbow said, showing her book. It's bullshit! Rainbow, dear, that's the wrong oxygen to take and you know it, Arity said, looking up her game from Monopoly against Tracy and Applejack. Well, Timmy is probably afraid that something is wrong. No shit rares, you think? Look, I'm no psychologist, Lyra says. He laid down a draw four. But something had to happen. If you want, I could go up there and check to talk her out. Maybe she needs someone to... God, you sound just like my mother, Trixie groaned. Are you sure we were in Swiss at birth? I'm just trying to help Trixie, Lyra shot back. Trixie wilted under her best friend's glare. I know. Straight said in a soft whisper. I'm sorry. Lyra reached over to where she was to give her friend a hug. It's okay. We're all just a little on edge right now. Especially since we're stuck here for the next few days. Still, we should do something, Pinky said. Maybe we can bake her a cake? A cake that says, Congratulations, not killing your cousin? Apple's Jack replied. Not a smart move, Super Cube. Not smart at all. You had to do something, Zell girls. Fireside insisted. So he was about to say more when Twilight reached the bottom of the stairs. Everyone was quiet as the scholarly teen walked over to the empty spot on the couch, called over the ball, and put her head on her sister's lap. It's okay, Twilight. Says it says softly as he stroked her sister's head. You're saint. She didn't mean it. <laughs> she really didn't. Twilight said to no one in particular, her eyes filling with tears. She went slightly as a sting went through her neck where she had been scratched by Anania's nails during the whole incident. She didn't mean it. I know she didn't, said it said, reaching down to give her hug her sister as best she could. I know. Twilight, Bon Bon began. Don't, Bonnie, please don't. It wasn't her fault. I know it. Something happened. I don't know what it was. Twilight says, tears fell. I love her. She's just as much a sister to me as Sunny is. The family's always been important to me. Papa didn't know how to respond to that, so she said nothing. Went back to the movie she and Flair I was watching. Speaking of Octavia, in the bedroom on the opposite side of the house, a door was closed and the lights were off. Against the door was a chair and a dresser and nightstand. The bed would have been as well, but it was too big to move. Even in her panic state, the sheets were ripped off the bed, though. And under the bed was the proverbial monster, covered in sheets, sleeping fearfully on the ground. The wind howled outside, and the rain slapped against the glass of the window repeatedly, enough to make it difficult for anyone to doze easily. But the girl didn't rest easy. Even if it had been a perfect day out, she couldn't rest easy. She nearly committed an act that was pure insanity, and she had no idea why. She knew she was hated. Stand for it. Life had begun to unravel and spiral out of control. Now it reached a point where there was no going back unless she grabbed the last bit of reason. She was going insane. She knew it. The people she loved most, her family, would suffer for it. But these were thoughts she would have had if she had been awake. Instead, she moved through a daytime nightmare, a torturous, twisting dream. One that wouldn't let her out until it rests free the last of her sanity. But Itivia mentally didn't know that. All she did was dream. The elegant strains of Hip Hop's 1965 jazz classic Elegance of Sapphire played through the Brentwood Museum. Dressed in a black clown with long gloves, Octavia walked through the galleries, admiring the works of art. 
There was others there, but they seemed vague and indistinct as he approached them. They seemed to vanish as the ether. So he started from a painting entitled The Goddess of Purity, though she didn't know the author's name. In it was a beautiful girl her age, dressed in the purest white robes imaginable. She carried a huge amethyst cut like an irregular star, and seemed to bring out the light in the girl's own violet eyes. The girl had long, flowing hair the color of ripe plums, while single locks of purple and magenta graced the left bangs of her hair. She had a smile that was pure and innocent, so much that it made Octavia feel like a part of her was missing, though she knew not why. Moving on, she glanced at other works of art, no, nothing catching her attention until she came across a huge work of marble, entitled The Confusion of Transformation. It was made of three pieces of marble. The first part was a horse running forward, rather half a horse, at the latter end. Finally detailed in the sculpting, the yellow singing of marble would have seemed real hard had it not been for the strange brand on the horse's flank, a yin-yang sunburst. In any case, the horse raced through the second part of the installation and the archway, and seen cards of the most delicate blue-gray Car Carrara marble available. The craftsmanship on the portal was so precise, our TV could almost see it as a gateway to another world. Lastly, the final part came forth, a delicate rose for shed of marble, depicting a young girl, no more than twelve, stepping through the mirror. She was nude, and the look on her card face was one of confusion and anger. Striking contrast between the beauty of the whole sculpture and the frozen rays on the face of the horse turned girl cut Octavia to the core. Make your turn for the statue once he took a final look at the whole artwork. From there, she hovered to a painting called The Abandonment. In it, the sky changed from a sunny, perfect day to a stormy, brutal one. On the perfect half, a couple strolled breezy and happily, as if they had nothing to care for in the world. The picture, however, had been revealed to be a lie, as a crying girl no older than ten started to reach out to them, as evil, unnatural hands threatened to drag her off a nearby cliff. This one resonated deeply within Octavia, so she wasn't aware of her why. She felt she wanted to rest the girl for the unnatural grass, and hand her off to the security of the clueless parents. Though well, maybe, given their actions, that might not have been the best course either. Regardless, Tussie Artwork says that this was prohibited, so she gave it no further thought and moved on. She moved on from the artworks, crossing a bridge leading to one part of the museum to another. The open-air skyway, too bright to look at in Los Angeles sunshine. It was odd, she knew. She had been born in Los Angeles, but had nearly lived all her life in Carolot. Her parents decided to move back to the place where her father was born, so the young couple could have support. This was the city of her birth, and it was as empty and soulless as the people often described Hollywood to be. Perhaps that was the truth of the city of angels. The angels were looking away, and all that was left was silence. Moving into the next room, she noticed it was bare, save for a singular mural that took up one of the long halls. Across from the outwork, however, were a few dozen chairs, and a screen that displayed video thrown from a ceiling-mounted projector. The video was blurry surrealist, it just felt like it belonged more in a Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art downtown than a place that specialized in the classics, such so as the Brentwood. Ignoring the video, she decided to turn her attention to the mural across the room. It was an artist that truly spoke to her, though she could not recall the name. It was a compilation of the three earlier works she had seen, tied together by a new painter. The goddess of purity moved hand in hand with the girl from the marble statue. Now the colors added to her, eyes as cyan as aquamarine gems, and hair as golden scholar that burned as fire. They accompanied the wings of flame on the back. The two women looked as though there was love between them. Not that it was lovers, but those who were very close. Sisters, perhaps. They moved on together because they seemed all familiar and comfortable together, and a part of Octavia felt as though she belonged, as if her heart ached with an unyielding pain because she was not part of the duet. At the far side of the mural, away from the brightness and purity of the two girls were hands outstretched. The hands, though almost vaguely more like claws, were almost attached to a mist that seemed to vaguely take form and shape. There was something primal, elemental about the intangible being. Yes, there had to be some being there. They reached in the direction of the two girls that made Octavia want to reach in and pull them to safety. She wasn't sure why. 
It was obviously a painting, and they were clearly fictional characters. But the artist could endanger such feelings in her. He was a master at his craft. But most of all was the figure in the center that truly took Octavia's soul. She looked to be an older version of the girl from the painting, right around Octavia's old age. She was in the nude with cuts and bruises, but she bled no ordinary blood. What dripped from her was, was, was black as oil or tar, giving her an inhuman, unnatural appearance that layered over and contrasted with her very human and shapen form. She seemed to be desperately calling towards the other two girls, away from the shapeless figure that Octavia realized was after her. The girl wanted them to stop and help her, hoping to escape with them. The girls were too busy in tune with each other to really understand. The creature knew that, and it was so bluntly stuck the girl in the middle, knowing that sooner or later it would have its due. Octavia turned away, away from the mural, taking advantage of one of those seats by the video presentation to collect her breath. This painting was, by far, the one that spoke her the most. I don't understand why. It felt like it was a part of her. Like a telling of her own life. Was that going to be possible, could it? Everything is possible, granddaughter. Octavia turned towards the voice to see another young woman sitting next to her. Wearing a gorgeous dress that seemed to be out of style in this day and age, she nonetheless looked good in it. She had long ivory hair, the same as Octavia's, save for two jagged shocks of scarlet and gold in her hair, the same colors as the transformed girl, but the same layout as the goddess of priority. Her skin was dark, not enough to be of African descent, but clearly enough to be Arabic. Her light blue eyes seemed as she would normally be bright, but at the moment, out the world's sadness in them. And lastly, her facial features, surprisingly, were the same as Octavia's own. Ron Talta. The girl smiled. Well, it'd probably take too long to say all the greats in between the English and it. She said with a giggle. <laughs> Besides, this is how I remember myself as. The girl who stepped out of the waters of the Lake of Samaria and surprised the vice count standing a day in the lake trying to impress an eighty friend. I suppose I was the one who impressed him. He married me, though I later turned out to be pregnant. She sighed. I loved Ali Marante, and when he claimed my son Luther as his own, we then had to see a career doses to Carlo, Grand Vaz, Adagio, and Cardinal Allegri as well. They grew up as performers like myself becoming great composers and espousers of royalty and nobility. Even now, my policy is everywhere, and I'm mostly in music. It's a life I've never expected, and a blessed one at that. She smiled sadly. I wish my parents would have known. I wish I knew what became of them. But I suppose such is the mystery of being a musica, isn't it? I tear his eyes wide in shock. Yo, I know. There's a great long distance between us. But even still... I'm glad someone in my family inherited my looks. My daughters got theirs from their father, and supposed descendants from theirs. As that means my teens were weak, and had to be supported, in a manner of speaking, before they came to the forefront in you. I... I think he wasn't sure how to refer to the woman beside her. Music is fine, she giggled. <laughs> it makes me feel young again. Well, you grow to an age, grandmother, you understand. Musica, what is all this? Artemia asked. This is magic. And maybe the fiery dream of a girl was too many problems dropped on her at once. Maybe it's just the magic that wants me, a grandmother lying in others remove, to see what I can do to help her look like a daughter. And many generations remove. Maybe you can't cope with the fact that you strangled someone who is like a sister to you. You're sliding into her sandy just to hide from the world. What do you feel? I don't know what to feel. Octavia looked away from Musica. They had the screen showing the blurry video. She realized with clarity that the video was showing her scenes from her own life. How she started to become shells of sunset. How she murdered Twilight's pet owl. How she re lied repeatedly to Rarity, who only wanted to help. The list ran on and on. For every scene for the past few months... All trainings of light for the dark. What had happened? She blinked. She looked around. She was standing in a desolate field 
waist deep in what appeared to be coins of tarnished black and metal. Standing next to her, heartbroken look on her face was Musica. Ateria, you can still turn away from this madness, Musica pled. As your ancestress, I beg you, please do so. I don't want you to hurt. You don't know her, bitch. Another voice echoed from nowhere, and somehow Octavia recognized it from the depths of her nightmares. You spoil me, you know that? Celestia says she lay down on the bed, naked as a jaybird and sipping from a margarita. The room was filled with nothing but candlelight, and giving her a massage of sable. He too was undressed, and right now rubbing on her back. Finally! You were too tense, Tia. That, or maybe old age is getting to you. He cracked. Well, if I make my boy toy keep up with me. She replied in a nonchalant voice, just as once ago as he. Then I must be doing something right. I'll say that you're doing something right if you landed me. He said, whispering in your ear. Keep a careful, Sable. I might just wear you out. She chuckled. It would probably be the first time I've been worn out over something I liked. He said soberly. Both looked at each other. And even looks lasted long enough for both to start righteously laughing with vain laughter. Well, here I am in the middle of a hurricane, spending time with the man I love. She sighed. Hardly how I expected my life to go, but I'm glad I did. Now I'm glad it didn't work out with frozen planes. Oh, well, I've told you a story about my previous love, so now it's your turn. He ached her. Sable, you're here giving me a massage. We've been intimate. It's you I left now, she told him. Can't I leave this one in the past? I've got a much more interesting prior relationship. If you're talking about Discord, Luna already told me, Sable replied. That you told Velvet you guys broke up while in high school, but you kept up with the on and off until your junior year of college. Plus, one of your students is his daughter, according to her. Damn cut, Celestia said, taking another sip from her margarita. Okay, fine, I'll mention it. I was 30 and he just transferred from the Everfree Glades High to Bella Fista High to work as the head of the humanities department. There was a guy there, Frank's in Plains, recently divorced, with as cute as a button daughter named Stained Glass. She was just adorable. Anyway, Plains and I tended to work together after school a lot. You know, I tend to overwork and so did he. Eventually, we had working together together. We started to dare us out on dates, and before I knew it, we were together. There wasn't just any one thing that did it, until we leaned over the table and kissed. Anyway, he and I were happy, and class really adored me. I adored her as well. I also began to wonder if I was stepmother material. Obviously, I don't have children of my own, but being a teacher is a teaching moment as well. And when the four years were together, I think we were heading towards merits. What happened? She closed her eyes. He had a family emergency that required him to move back to his hometown of Fairview in Alaska. He asked me if I marry him and come up with him. But right about that time, I received the officer to take over as fight principal of County High. I was torn. Really torn. It was a chance of a lifetime. And I knew where he was. At best, I would be promoted to the position I was. The Unified School District, because he had connections even offered me to persist in a vice principal of one of the elementary schools there. It wasn't really my style, but I was torn. I had to choose between the man I loved and the little girl who became my daughter, a girl who already had a mother figure walk out of her life. Then on the other hand, was the position at county, being offered to me especially at a time when the rest of my family followed me and Luna from San Diego. She so down the rest of the margarita. I stayed. Two years later, Plain Swing kindled his relationship with his ex-wife, and they remarried. That hurt, but the part that hurt the most was that I let Stained Glass down. She needed a mother and looked to me, and I failed her. We still talk occasionally, especially now she moved to Horseshoe Bay, but it's never been the same. And after that, I stopped dating until I met you. He took the message immediately. I'm not leaving to you. I'm not leaving, and this isn't going to be replayed in front of your past relationships. <laughs> you think my love life is bad as you see my sister's? Well, I promise, I'm not leaving, and I guarantee we're going to see this through to the end. I don't know where that is yet, but I'll be with you every step of the way. Even if it means a ring of kids, I probably got about a decade or more left in my childbearing years. 
don't get me wrong, the outside doesn't age normally, but some parts of me still register as a 56-year-old woman. Now I wish I was still 31. Why's that? Well, what if I ask you to love right now, and I want a child soonest, that the bomb on my bottle is the clock's about to go off. We've only known each other for two months, and we're already living together. We're moving faster than many so-called whirlwind relationships, and I can't imagine them being fair to you. Who said anything about being fair? Siebel asked. Celestia was caught off guard about that. I... I don't understand. Age is sorry to you. You're a woman who's been hurt by love and choices. I suppose it defies us all, but I can hear the haunting loneliness in your voice. You see that what Velvet has on a regular basis, and you're craving it. You hear about the loving married life that Sombra and his wife have, and you want for yourself. You're afraid that you're throwing yourself at the first person who looked at you, as if there's an expiration date on you. Trust me, there isn't. He grinned and added, I'm familiar with you enough for your body that I haven't seen one yet. The educator couldn't help but break out into a full body blessed that <laughs> flatterer. Maybe. But you're being unfair to me and the fact that you're forgetting one thing. I came after you, not the other way around. I didn't know your age and obviously I didn't care after you told me. I just saw the beautiful woman that caught my attention. It would have been even if some of our delinquent students hadn't <clears throat> introduced us. He leaned close to her. Fairy tale relationships may be just that. But sometimes we have to believe in love at first sight. So if you're asking me, given you already want me to move in, if I'm interested in making that relationship permanent? I do. And I don't. And that last part isn't that we should probably wait at least a year before thinking about engagement. Because otherwise your family and mine are probably going to think we absolutely lost it. See so after that, I hadn't considered that point. See you mid. But I can't think I would anyone else I'd rather lose than Elver. Oh, when it comes to you, he stated, I lost it a long time ago.